Curtis Knight, Executive Director of California Trout and your host of the Fishwater People Podcast. Welcome to Season 2 and Happy New Year. We're back from the holidays with a great lineup of interviews and topics for this season. And to start it all off, we're going to get a little philosophical with Obi Kaufman. You've heard of his work before. He's an author, an artist, and a naturalist, just to name a few of his modalities. In this episode, we'll focus on some of his work, especially the California Lands Trilogy, a set of books born of his multidisciplinary approach, from field sciences to the arts, and even myth, magic, and spirituality. Our conversation touched on a lot of these subjects, and much like his work, or perhaps like a winding river, meandered between systems of thought to explore the unique natural world of California and how it intersects with our cultures, our economy, our changing climate, and our internal states of being. All this swirling around a central theme that seems appropriate to ring in the new year, abundance and what that looks like. So let's get into it and meet Obi. My name is Obi Kaufman and I am the author of the California Field Atlas series of books. Obi Kaufman, welcome to the Fish Water People podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Curtis. This is one of the first podcast interviews we've done where I ha- we haven't met. So this is a mm. great opportunity to kind of meet over podcasts. So maybe maybe right out of the gate, let's just go right to it. Who are you, Obi Kaufman? Oh, well, thank you for kicking it off with an existential crisis. Yeah, <laughs> who am I? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a naturalist. I'm, I'm a creative heart who's developed their whole career around the idea of, of being ever more from this place. How do I finally stop colonizing my heart as that is mirrored around the land? And I'm also a Democrat small D, right? I'm, I'm really want to democratize the idea of geographic literacy. And I do that through making these field atlases, as I call them, the, the, the California Field Atlas series, which is now accumulating in what is the fifth book, The Deserts of California. But I, I've made the, the California Field Atlas was the first one in 2017. Then I did The State of Water, Understanding California's Most Precious Resource. And then I did The Forests of California, The Coasts of California, and The Deserts of California, which is now ending the California Lands Trilogy. So I make these books, hundreds of hand-painted maps of how earth, air, fire, and water and these grand living matrices, uh, these ecological systems. What character of California am I going for is ultimately predicated on the idea that by knowing where I am, I might know who I am. So to answer your question, who am I? I'm probably going to push these books and just point and say there's some there's something there that is that is that is me it certainly it certainly fills up all of my working days I mean, I, I spent uh, the first bit of my life just walking California uh, and I looked to spend the last half of my life walking California and and it, it, in the interim I am now figuring it out or at least beginning to that's a tough question who who, who are you and I, I love that explanation that you're describing there. I think the books really do give you some insight there. And you you say who you are. You sort of say this in, in a variety of ways in the books. A naturalist, a painter, a lover of the natural world. I love the combination of the art and the poetry and that side of things with something that's very factual. There's a ton of information in here too about this state that I love. How do you bridge that gap between the art, the science, and then the accessibility of all that. Well, that, that's exactly it. That would be that would be the lifelong goal. It's not a destination you get to. It's a process you work through. Now, I am the product of uh, a modern scientific mindset. Both my parents were scientists. My father was an astrophysicist. My mother was a clinical psychologist, right? So I have this conciliant idea, if you will, to use this word that Neil Wilson coined that describes the, the unity of all knowledge. Uh, normally, conciliant theory is sequestered to like, the biological sciences. For example, like, how do you tie, tie conservation biology to molecular biology? That's a, that's a conciliant process, right? So since I was a very young age, uh, you know, Dr. Kaufman's son was going to be a mathematician. I've always been fascinated with sy- systems thinking because it was quite frankly drilled into me every day after school and high school was calculus only. And um, 
I got good at that, but I realized that there was some narrative limitations. And that's like when I got to school there at UC Santa Barbara, I spent uh, uh, most of my time there skipping class and heading into the San Inez wilderness, searching for the Chumash art sites. And the Chumash nation uh, was, uh, you know, 100,000 people at the time of contact. And there's thousands of art sites across those beautiful mountains and there's and they're and they're all still there and there's nothing like you know pulling back a sea and Otis bush and seeing something that looks that looks maybe something like a like a like a you know 14 foot condor painting but it has like you know it has some like insect motifs or some mandala like motifs and what's that something like a human foot down there or whatever if you don't know the 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 chumash paintings go check them out they informed me in my life as an artist and as a philosopher of what can be called aesthetic theory tremendously how do we tell this story uh inside this very complex lexicon of, of, of contemporary semiotics if you will, like sign giving like how do i tell you of my love for california through these paintings how do i express this affection for conservation philosophy especially in terms of indigenous mindset versus colonial mindset for example disarming that within my own heart and popularizing or, or helping to propagate anyway the the idea of justice making right uh, the work for justice helping the arc of the universe bend that way right which you know of course leads me to hopefully my work with cal Trout. but i think i think that what we have here in the the grand mystery that is the paintings is this idea of what art can be you know standing in front of the, one of those beautiful chumash paintings uh, the, the particular narrative of most of this work has been forgotten for now, although the, the oral traditions of the Chumash nation are still very robust and very sophisticated and very complex. It's very hard for my mind to see images in those paintings and those abstract images and to reconcile the story with them. And I wonder if I could take that one of those Chumash artists from 500, 600, 1,000 years ago and show them one of my paintings, if they would just be as confused by the symbols that I was trying to express in my watercolor smearings, right? Like how is that a frog? That doesn't look anything like a frog, a bunch of spilt water on the page, right? Like, and that's what I mean by operating inside of this very complex cultural lexicon, but it's all cracking open now, isn't it? In the 21st century, as we are realizing that, um, yeah. I don't mean to to dismissively use the word we. There's a there's a great many of quote unquote us who have known this all the time, uh, but as as a sort of overculture of colonialization is realizing that we've been very bad at designating non-human people, <laughs> or designating colonial culture has been very difficult. I think this is this is evidenced by by the genocide of the um, indigenous Californian populations, right? Like, like these were people, and this ties directly to the thing that gets me up out of bed every morning, Curtis, which is which is uh, this 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 shadow in my own heart from this uh, extractivist in just system that is symbolized by things by things in the landscape things that are in the landscape such as these dams these impoundments yeah. these anti-connective pieces to a better story being told yeah you, yeah. you mentioned this you mentioned this this really struck me and you're touching on it right now but you said in one of your books, striking the balance between extraction and replenishment and replacing the idea of reclamation with the vision of restoration will be the work of the next several generations to come. Sort of what you're touching mm. on here. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Gosh, you know, I, I was thinking about the Eel River. I'm thinking a lot about the Eel River these days, you know, and I mean, it's funny that even that's sort of misnamed the eel river after the pacific lamprey not really an eel at all 
But uh, the okay. weot word for for the eel is is yacht, which is which means abundance. Like this this river is a place of abundance. And I'm thinking of the the Weot massacre of 1860, which is when 400 people killed on on, on Weot Island in the middle of Humboldt Bay um, one night uh, by by the settlers. And what a horrible crime that was only four generations ago. You know, you hear these days, especially in like the Yurok Tribal Council that that 2018 proclaimed, designated, ruled, adjudicated that the Klamath River is indeed a legal person and subjects to all rights. person might hold such that the Klamath River, a river might have its day in court as a person. I mean, what a, what a, what a beautiful idea. And so, so only four generations ago, and you, and you hear a lot in the, in the land back movement, you hear about the idea of like seven generations right? and preserving the abundance the abundant river for the next seven generations or only four generations back. Like we've, we've only just begun this journey and it's cracking open so fast. That's, that's the thing that, that as a student, also science history across the 20th century, like how fast the ecological story has changed, like how much we've learned in the past 20 years of things like, fire ecology which is finally an academic discipline removed from forestry so like as we as we discuss and we begin to rotate even since i wrote those words that that you just uh, so generously quoted there you know I've, I've i've also incorporated this new vocabulary word this idea of rematriation rematriation is part of the land back movement where we have this this emerging relationship with this place towards greater abundance. I mean, you often hear the criticism of uh, uh, towards, you know, ecologically minded folks that we're going to have to do with less. And actually, I would counter and say that this mode of paradigm shift leads to what is actually having clean water free of cyanotoxins for example free of liquid leached mercury from in the groundwater from from uh, these deadbeat coastal dams up and down the uh, the coastal ranges we are recognizing that the greatest treasure is something like clean water what what better to indicate what a healthy culture and society might be then the uh, the indicator species, the the grand parade of anadromous fish that so need nothing but the three C's: clean, clear, cold water. Yeah, I want to stop you on salmon because I obviously you you, you, ha- you have me at salmon. And a quick side note for our listeners who can't see what I'm holding: I'll be referencing one of Obi's books during our conversation, "The State of Water." Understanding California's Most Precious Resource. I highly recommend it. It's a great read. On page 71, yeah, okay. and, and really before this, when you're talking about salmon, I just think it's amazing. It's something that we talk a lot about, just how they're an indicator for so many things, water security, uh, river health, ecosystem health, biodiversity, um, food security. I mean, you, you yes. click them off, sustainable future economy, all that. But you end it by saying, without salmon, the ecosystem collapses. When dominoes begin to fall and ecosystems begin to collapse, who is it to say how it might end? Saving the salmon is as much about saving ourselves as it is anything else. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's this complexity theory, right? So like I described a little bit of this aesthetic theory. I described a little bit of of this consilient theory. And there's really a third leg to my ecological philosophy, if you will, which is this complexity theory, which is which is the nature of uh, trophic cascades and cascadings of cascading effects across local watersheds and magnified out toward uh, across the biosphere or more commonly i'm calling it the ecosphere this these days because the biosphere is actually just one layer in, in a larger system of abiotic factors that are planetary in scale the salmon are 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 symbolic in that sense and and they're 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 mythologic in that sense too and now you know the idea of myth is such like 
has such a such a bad rap in, in contemporary media in that in that it has been sequestered or or exiled really to the to to being synonymous with with something like a lie like oh that's just a myth so it's dismissed right when in fact the process of mythologizing really is the process of sublimating reality where symbols emerge that inhabit this space that is non-rational but certainly empirical we know them to be true we can identify and we can understand them they exist and yet they don't exist this is why i can't bring myself to be like a like an atheist or something like that i mean i i don't go to church or anything but 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 this realm of spirituality in me that, that this this realm that that through my practice i am able to attend to this fullness of life that is rich in emergent phenomena that come from a mysterious source ultimately and this becomes applicable when you start considering the the mass of complexity that we're dealing with especially in terms of consciousness how do the salmon find their one tributary again how do how does the golden plover tiny little bird navigate two thousand miles to one spit of land in the aleutian island year after year there's this this incredible quantum uh complexity at work here that that speaks to this grand system that 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 in fact when we touch on when we touch on together curtis i thank you so much for for inviting this conversation where i can sort of work out these ideas in real time as i think about them at length by myself way too much i think of i think of like the shelley quote right that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world and the poets who are able to tap in by whatever practice I know plenty of fishermen, for example, who are poets, right? You just by their yeah. practice, able to touch the grandness of creation in a way that that that's like a ritual. And there's that, and there's, there's that quasi spiritual mythologizing again. The ritual of atonement at one moment, when when the subject and the object become one, and we are together in this network realization that dissolves for a second the horror of so much anti-nature injustice. I love watching you sort that out. It brings up so many things in my mind too. And I think one of the things you're touching on, I mean, you have the art in here. You certainly have the science and a lot of facts, but I think you're really talking about this thing that kind of hovers over a lot of this stuff. The complexities, you can say it's spiritual a bit, just magic in that. We talk a lot about that with Sam and I mean, it's just magic. I mean, you can try to explain it with science and details and facts and research for sure. But there is a sense of magic that these creatures in the natural world sort of inherently have. And one of the things that I'm so fascinated about is your approach here, because, you know, clearly you see, you give a really honest portrayal of the California as it is today. And I like how you jump back a thousand years and ahead a thousand years. And I want to talk about that a little bit too, but you're very pragmatic too. You're very pragmatic, but you're an optimist. Talk about sort of that flavor because, you know, when, when a lot of people will dig into what we got going on here in California, it, it can be overwhelming. It can be daunting and you can get real pessimistic real quick, but you maintain this pragmatic and optimist approach that's right yeah as if, as if we have a choice optimism of what embracing the possibility of greater wealth in the future and by wealth remember like we're talking about like the eel river right the, the we ought word for the eel rivers is we at which is abundance so we're we're, we're fundamentally reapproaching the idea of what real wealth is the the true the true treasure that is clean water um optimism is claiming that the world is not dead for example never was and actually never could be okay you know, california every every single one of our landscape types is either threatened or endangered every single one of them every single one of our habitat types is in danger but we enjoy a very low extinction okay it's less than one percent it's very, it's very dangerous for a scientist to 
call something extinct because extinct ultimately is, is the end of hope on some level. And we're getting dangerously close to things like you know the Delta smelt, for example, which is, which is really uh, tragic. And it's, it's so tragic that it, it's hard to let it into my heart. Yeah. And, you know, and just uh, on that point, it's an interesting point. Um, and you think about just our trout, steelhead, and salmon, there are 32 different kinds of trout, steelhead, and salmon throughout the state, yet we've only lost one, and that's in the McLeod River, the bull trout. It's the only one that's been extirpated from the state. So kind of to your point that that's pretty amazing that we yes. still have these resilient creatures that have been able to survive all the modifications, alterations, and all those things we as humans in this this day and age have done to them. If all the pieces are still on the board, that that means that there's this miracle to steward, right? And and there's that word miracle, which which is kind of akin to the word you use magic, which is like, you know, the, these weird purple words that are very difficult to translate into um, some sort of uh, environmental assessment report, for example. But we can use here in terms of uh, a popular narrative. So, so how I'm talking today, Curtis, you know, like, uh, this optimism, discovering that the, the world is very much alive and flowing. And this optimism that, like, this optimism that knowing that the story that we're telling transcends even argument, and that seems impossible to break out of this economic juggernaut this machine that exists all around us like a like a thousand beehives that 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 works so hard to divide us from one another this divisive rhetoric that's everywhere and drips from our social media everything is a debate when in fact the only thing that's ever changed anyone's mind about anything hasn't been a debate at all it's been telling a better story Okay, so telling the better story of what abundance actually is, actually what justice in an ecological sense is. One of the things that you said is you feel optimistic that this place is going to be better off at the end of the 21st century than it was at the end of the 20th century. And I think that that sort of encapsulates sort of that optimism that you're getting at. We certainly have the capacity that we have the potential, we have the opportunity to make that a reality, right? So like, I mean, when I was in the mid eighties, when I was you know, backpacking as a young man, big stir, just like feeling like nature itself was something that I missed. Like it was something that happened and there were no condors, there's no whales, there's no otters, there's no tule elk, there's no white tail American kites, no salmon. It's all just like, gone we're just on this slope towards simplification such a dangerous perilous trajectory and yet now every single one of those species that i mentioned is on the rebound if if you had told the the teenager that was me um that 50 years there'll be 500 condors like that is good of conservation policy that is love that is realizing the value of the more than human world and now we're involved in the last great hope for california salmon the removal of the four dams on the upper klamath river the largest salmon restoration in the history of the country and you guys are leading the fight from the matilia dam to the free the eel project which is in line with this emerging ethos of what is value and yeah, I understand that what we're talking about here is is particularly antithetical to a certain mindset of entrepreneurialism that thinks along these linear trajectories of extraction, production, and disposal, when in fact we are opening up this greater industry, this greater industry that is circular in its economy, in its function, and navigating that is is inclusive and leads to this kind of justice that transcends traditional exclusive definitions of what justice was and by inviting all these different kinds of justices and we could go down the list of all of these different kinds of justices but at the end they're one and this gets to something like 
like one of our great agrarian philosophers, Wendell Berry might say like solving for pattern, where you, you, you solve for the one thing and ends up taking care of the many things. And this is the through line between concepts such as connectivity and uh, rematriation, if you will, towards a greater reparation, or shall I say the, uh, the, the mediation of the worst aspects of say like climate breakdown by way of anthropogenic global warming, if you will, to put it on a planetary scale. So this posture towards the natural world and the solutions here being on the table, given how much we've learned, even in the past 20 years, given how much we've learned and how much we are now listening finally to traditional ecological knowledge, like a thousand year old paradigms of how natural regimes such as water regimes and fire regimes on the land can work inside of these systems that as we already established are still here. We can negotiate uh, the, the end of the 21st century being in a better spot than we were at the end of the 20th century. You're listening to the Fishwater People podcast, proudly presented by California Trout, a nonprofit organization founded over 50 years ago. What started as a commitment to resilient wild fish has grown into a broader mission supported by our four pillar approach to conservation, science, restoration, community engagement, and advocacy. We love the work we do and we couldn't do it without our supporters. So we wanna hear from you. Why do you support Caltrout? What makes California's rivers special to you? Let us know. To have your answer featured on the show, just record a voice memo and email to podcast at caltrout.org. That's podcast at caltrout.org. Timeframes are so interesting because, you know, when you think about a generation, you know, that's a lifetime for somebody. But it's, but it's a relatively short period of time on the scale of things. And you think about, just take our big dams, for example, and the majority yes. of those going in, in California over a 30 to 40 year period. That's when most of the big ones went in. That's a very, on the scale of it, short term experiment. <laughs> you know, not that all dams are incredibly, you know, like evil to society. I mean, some of them, you know, maybe we're gonna have to live with for a while, but there is a lot out there that were not well thought out the costs and benefits to how those things um, impacted societies and people over the long term. The inequities, especially with some of those are pretty, pretty stark. How do we start to build on the momentum? The Klamath is great. How do we start to build on that momentum to really start to fix some of these not well thought out water infrastructure projects that we did over a very short period of time? A resting agent that is an impounding dam upon the living landscape that that dismantles the basic functional needs of uh, biodiversity. So why do we need biodiversity? Well, it turns out that biodiversity leads towards this filtration, these these redundant filtration systems across the adaptive cycle. And so what I mean by that is that we're looking for these true treasures, these abundant resources that will keep giving, as opposed to the linear economic practice that I was talking about before, these, these true cycles of, uh, you can just go through them, like earth is like topsoil, if you will, or, or fire would be good fire, good fire on the land. Or, or water, we'll call it CCC water, right? Clean, clear, cold water. Or even air, like ozoneless air, right? You know, so, so we've got these four platonic elements in the earth, air, fire, and water. And it turns out biodiversity, these biotic agents are, the, are what makes those four things happen. And the dam, especially the coastal dams, filled with this toxic sediment and cyanotoxins and other poisons. What humans have done with water in California rivals anything that anyone has done anywhere with anything. The 1,500 dams that we have now across the state, we move water in, in a way that humans have never done before. I think that the great 
triumph of 20th century water infrastructure in California will be met again by how it again transforms over the next 100 years as we are learning about greater resiliency and we are taking into account a reassessed valuation of what and how a good life can be lived as a Californian that gets straight to the, the character that I'm always chasing. Yeah, I love that sense of uh, scale and optimism, as I mentioned. And you you framed, you said four things that really resonated, resonated to me that you, you sort of framed them as a dilemma. And as soon as you called them a dilemma, is it different for me than a problem? A dilemma is like, um, it, it feels bigger. It feels like it's a societal thing that we are wrestling mm. with that we, or that we need to wrestle with. So I, I really took that, but these four things, you know, water security for all that makes a ton of sense. You know, that's something we think about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. our climate future that makes mm -hmm. a ton of sense, given, especially what we're seeing going on right now, protecting biodiversity. Absolutely. And then you said this fourth thing, you said honoring our history of agriculture and purpose. And that one kind of threw me. I was like, what's that? So talk to me about <laughs> that, that fourth bullet right there. What's that? What's going on there? I mean, the, the water development across California was built on this blessing and this curse that California has, right? Especially across what has been historically called the breadbasket of America, which is, which is the great central valley, the Sacramento and San Joaquin River Valley. Uh, and that, that great curse is that we have the best soil in the world, this Holocene alluvium. The sand go up the west slope of the Sierra Nevada and deposit hundreds of thousands of metric tons of calcium, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and then underneath the snow, and then are carried down in these massive flows towards uh, Lake Cochrane and, and later Lake Tulare and across, you know, and, and that happens over hundreds of thousands of years. And you, and you get uh, um, this, this Holocene alluvium that is, turns out to be the most fertile soil on the planet. Except the problem is, is that it, it rarely rains more than 13 inches a year. You need about 20 inches a year to, uh, to, to grow anything without irrigation. And so the, the whole process of, of industrializing that agriculture has over the past 100 years has, has been the establishment of this, of this particular kind of California character, this can do attitude that, that, that is dominating that is paternalistic in many ways, but is now recognizing a new economic reality. And namely what that is, is that in the past 40 years, this, this economic phenomenon has occurred where California's GDP has decoupled from water. Now agriculture accounts for about three to 4% of our, of our state's GDP, where just 50 years ago it was like 40 to 50%. You know, Curtis, as I, as I tour these books, especially my, my second book there, Understanding California's Most Precious Resource, the State of Water, I go to Fresno, I go to Bakersfield, I go to, I go to the Mojave, I go to Truckee and Nevada City, and, and, and I'm on this fine line of, of rhetorical divisiveness. And what I'm really saying is that our most precious resource is not actually the substance of water. The subtitle of my book seems to suggest that it might be, but rather it's this is this ability to trust each other with a story in this in this fractious narrative media environment that threatens to sink the whole ship lest we begin to 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 honor the stories of others and in in a way that that perhaps perhaps doesn't get uh, the, the the popular time that it should and. Uh, I'm finding that most of it is illusion anyway. There's not a person in California who wants a degraded environment. Nobody wants that. Like nobody wants to, to, to live now unjust lives. So how do we capitalize on that? How do we tell the better story of what abundance actually can be? And there is, there is a lot of room to pivot. And yet, and yet, as we as we are in this, we realize so many bottlenecks are sort of closing in all around us as we are we are attempting to navigate through these very complicated modalities of storytelling. Like what is true even about these great planetary systems? How do we do that? Well, you know, I I've, I've been involved for the past uh, year now with 
the chairman of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, Greg Saras, has become my partner in this podcast that he and I do called Place and Purpose. And Greg Saras is a great steward of his of his people's stories. We gather once a month to discuss seasonality across Northern California and, and discuss these kinds of things, these kinds of issues. And so this leads me to this sort of like freewheeling discussion that you and I are having as we are discussing the miracle of resurgent nature, resurgent indigenous communities after 500 years of attempted extinction, erasure, and enslavement. You know, the, the, the voice of indigenous California it never had the opportunity to be as clear, loud, and heard as it is now. And recognizing that voice in concert with with the great, and I'm, I'm not dismissing the goodness of of California modernity. I think we can we there is room to exist together. I would say that the first step then to answer your question about about where do we begin would begin with we begin with identifying the commonalities with what we want and establishing then the common good. That and that and I would posit then that this this great abundance of Let's just start with clean water. Yeah, that, that that's a great place to start. And and it is interesting too. I think it seems a fairly unique moment in time where there's finally this social awareness coming to, I mean, just, just take, for example, how our relationship with native Californians, it, it feels like it's changing. It sure is uh, a long time overdue. And that in itself is hard to, hard to really, um, absorb and think about, but it's, it's, it's yeah. good to see that we seems to be progressing. And you add that on top of, you know, some of these effects of climate change, especially if you just think about water where we, we, we've stretched our water, we've, we've created these, these, when it's drought, these, these tensions that happen when it's wet, these floods that happen, they're already there, but then you compound it with, um, this change in climate and it is happening. Um, how, it, so to me, it's a unique moment in time where you have external pressures from climate change coming down onto our system. You have sort of a social awakening. I don't want to overstate that too much, but there's a, there's a, there's some rethinking happening, especially in some parts of, of the state more than others. D- does that feed into sort of your optimism that the pressures in a sense are coming to bear where it's forcing us to think things a little bit different. There's so much to learn. There's so much to learn, Curtis, that it's almost as if like there's this, this wonder, like it's almost like this magic well, oh, there's the magic again, but like, but like it's, it's a metaphor, right? So it's this magic well that you drink from and the more water you drink, the more water there is. And the metaphor then being of knowledge. The more you learn, the more you realize that there is to learn. It's not, it's not a finite amount of knowledge. And California offers that subject. And that's why I uh, will very uh, happily continue in my subject, uh, learning every day, every day. Uh, and, and then, of course, now tying that to, to this popular discourse is a mysterious process that can only that only makes sense if i work to understand it myself this is how i escape this sort of like didactic i'm not i'm not thinking of myself so much as like a like a teacher certainly not an expert what well, rather what i'm doing is inviting you to come with me on this journey on this adventure in fact, with the first line of my first book was that this is a love story. Relationship with this place matures and develops just like my relationships and my human life do. Finally, The Deserts of California, my final book in the California Lands trilogy, uh, the first line of the book is going to be that this is an adventure story. And that's what we've got going on. It's an adventure story. In our folly, in our wisdom, let us hold together and we'll figure it out. That's awesome. I, I can't wait to see the desert Atlas just having gone through the other ones here. And 
amazing amount of content. I'm still just blown away about what this time commitment must have been like mm. um, over a relatively short period of time. But you give a you give a taste of, I think in one of the books you say you've been working on this book for your entire life and in a lot of ways. I think you were mentioning the field atlas there and you said one thing that book is not is not you banging your fist on the table. Those days are over, which immediately for me is like, oh, well, what were those those fist banging days? I mean, what what uh, what are you what what was going on back then? Uh, yeah, righteous self indignation. The the well, I think I think maybe even to back up a little bit more abstractly, uh, ethically, my vocation as an artist, this thing that I'm compelled to do, this the thing that I believe that I'm called to do, this this most appropriate way of me interacting with my own voice, letting something shine through, letting myself be the vehicle of something. My attention then is to my art and not to my activism. And by doing that, by freeing myself up from that righteousness, from that political disposition, I can, I, I am able to present this work, not necessarily as textbooks, right? I'd like to deconstruct the idea of the expert. I'd like to approach uh, these issues in a way that is uh, engaging a beauty and an applicable relevance to a daily life of honor, respect, and thanksgiving that I attempt to walk in. At the end of the day, what can we do but love our watershed? There's one thing to do. If there's one thing that you can do, give it back in that regard. It doesn't feel like an incredible amount of work to get up at then five in the morning like I do. I enjoy painting in the dawn light. That is how I get to participate and give ultimately to the wider battery, if you will, of, of joy. There is such great confusion within the mind of the Anthropocene about who we are, where we're going, great panic and great trauma that if I can put some emotional surplus against the deficit that is spoon fed to us across so many rhetorical pathways, um, and to the con connectivity as opposed to the divisiveness, I, I will then at the end of my long day of work, be able to put my head on my pillow with, with a fair amount of, of knowledge and security that I've done what I can. I think you do a great job of, of that. You're not trying to convince anybody of anything. You know, it's, it's more about your, your, your telling these stories. You're, you're almost sharing your enthusiasm for these places in California, the facts that surround them, the the way they make you feel. But it's not, it's certainly not an activist book. It's certainly not saying, hey, we must do. It's more observational, which I think is really, is really satisfying. And I just want to talk as we, as we start to wind down a little bit, just this sense of place. And mm -hmm. certainly this is a sense of place in that it is California, but you talk a little bit about how you know some places really well. You talk about Mount Diablo, sort of uh, your proving grounds where you grew up. And I think it's really important for us as Californians, especially those that have this long relationship with a singular place to really step back and observe how that place is changing. Because I've certainly seen it in my lifetime. I live at the base of Mount Shasta. I've been here most of my adult life. And I see in the last 20 years how things are changing, that the snowpack disappeared in the summer for the first time in the last couple of years, that glaciers are melting at an unprecedented rate. I see in a place that I know so well changes. And I think it's really important for us as Californians to kind of think about that place you know really well. Think about how it's changing. How do you take that sense of place? You really build on that sense of place nicely in these books. Right. Yeah. It, it, isn't it interesting that the, the place itself is changing? But also at the same time, we need to steel ourselves against establishing a, a, a ecological rhetoric that that shifts with weather whiplash, if you will, that is uh, so evident already in the 21st century. 
you know, the, the, I, I hear the um, political media, if you will, saying, well, now that we have all the water, we can do what we want, or at least there, there is a, there's a rather nefarious uh, whisper that falsely suggests that, that now we are okay or, or that, or that the drought is now over when in fact, when this, this, this pattern of atmospheric river is, is incredibly true to the, the climate consensus of, of so many scientific reports that suggest that we will have more precipitation and more aridity at the same time. And we will have greater seasons of drought and greater and more intense events of, of precipitation. And, um, as as the years go on, we're going to see that. Uh, you know, I, discussing the, the the climate history of California. California has always been a very dramatic place, and century long droughts are not too far in our past history. We've enjoyed a very wet century and a half here, and yet I'm reassured to think of how. The oak trees, for example, oak trees that are still alive today, individual oak trees who remember century long droughts, who might be, you know, a good, a good valley oak can live to be 400 years old. And, and, and they might remember droughts of 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Well, it feeds into your extinction thing. That's helping explain why so few of the species out there are extinct in here in California because they they've they've endured a lot over over the thousands of years that they've evolved in this very variable climate that has had long extended periods of wetness and dryness in its past. Right. And so the the last point on your question of place. So so we said before that my books were not necessarily like like preachy. I'm glad I'm glad that they're not. But I I do hope to add a bit of of there, there's quite a bit of criticism. There's quite a bit of critical thinking, especially applied towards policy. I'm cautiously supportive, but I'm critical of the 30 by 30 plan. Because as we said before, or as you alluded to in your question, I suppose, is that is that it's not just about the superlative wild places that we need to protect. There needs to be a whole democratization of the landscape. And that's where I really hope my, my books also sort of unplug from unplugged from being some sort of like tour guide or travel guide of like, you know, the marquee places of California, like you need to go visit here or go visit there, or even like more emphasis. Certain counties, for example, like San Joaquin County or San Benito County, there's great hiking there too. There's endemic species there too. There's ecology there too that needs to be protected. So like the 30 by 30 program is a wonderful idea. And I really love the idea of focusing on, you know, high value connected ha- habitat, for example, but it certainly is not a cheap receipt to trash the other 70%. Right. And if it is that, then we've completely missed the point. We missed it. Yeah. I love that perspective. I mean, it's more about, you, know, you can't set aside a certain amount and call it good. It's more yeah. about how all these things, this connectivity really needs to spread throughout our society and the way we use our natural resources, our water, our forest, until you get all that working in a way that's a little more sustainable, we're going to always going to have these sort of hiccups and catastrophes and, and strains. And I think it also goes back to that inequity side too. And you see a lot of talk about that right now. And I think Wade and his crew in Sacramento have done a good job of really recognizing the inequity in, in how we've established a lot of these things, including water use and, and impacts of air quality and all, all these things that go on down the road. So recognition is a big place to start for a lot of these things. And now I think rolling up our sleeves and seeing how we can actually start to influence a little bit more is what we're looking forward to do. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So this new book, The Deserts of California, as we are really relying on the deserts to do a lot of that work for the 30 by 30 program in general. And uh, in the deserts, we have this situation where we're, we're really considering trading this idea of nature. We're trading nature for nature as we are, as we are uh, considering hundreds of thousands of acres of solar projects to get us towards this carbon neutral goal. And what that ultimately does then is, is destroy an exact one-to-one ratio corresponding of California's precious desert ecology as well. So navigating that 
we're negotiating that fine line is 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 a great dilemma. There's your there's your favorite word again. The challenge and opportunity is probably is probably yeah. a good way to put yeah. it too. Well, I lo- I look forward to seeing the deserts. It's I would say probably the the most unfamiliar terrain of those topics that you you chosen for me and. I think for a lot of people, they they tend to be empty. They tend to be in that corner of the state that um, not not everybody always gets to. So I look forward to deserts and uh, and Obi. I just want to thank you for taking not just the time out today, but really for the time that you've invested in these books. They are incredible. Um, I can't. I again, I can't imagine just the energy that it takes and the and the and the work ethic that it really takes to produce those. But you have given us a gift. You. have I've learned a lot in these books, but also really thought differently about this place we call California. So I really, really thank you for oh, opening your eyes. You know, thank you. You know, I, I love this this format of the podcast and I really appreciate you indulging me as I work out oh, yeah. some of these some of these ideas. You know, I I, uh, I I came into our conversation today not thinking that it was an interview on purpose, you know, so, cause I wanted to, I wanted to explore some new ground with you, but thank Cal Trout for all the leadership you offer in your work, your, your activist work and your political leadership. It's really uh, fun to follow and fun to support. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that. All of us here appreciate that. And um, thanks again. Thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much to Obi Kaufman for joining us. To learn more about him and his work, visit coyotethunder.com. That's where you'll find the trilogy, the California Field Atlas, and the State of Water. You can also tune in to his podcast, Place and Purpose, wherever you choose to listen. And his book on deserts of California is now published and available, so make sure to check it out. I'm Curtis Knight, Executive Director of Cal Trout, and your host of the Fishwater People podcast. This episode was written, produced, and engineered by Bridget Shaw and Drew Alvarez of Pusher Media, right here in the historic train and trout town of Dunsmuir, California, along the banks of the Sacramento River. And as always, many thanks to Wilco for our theme song.